I have a feeling there's not going to be a whole lot of um, clips, funny, clippable moments no, from this particular not, recording. I don't think there's going to be any clips, to be honest. Like, and that's fine. I mean, it's, it's a pretty somber <gasps> movie, dude. And it's like, I think just playing it straight is the best way to go about this, and not try and force any jokes or anything. Oh, you can't stop me from being inappropriate. I'll always be. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Anime Club After Dark's movie reviews, a discussion detailing the good, the bad, and the downright ridiculous of anime movies. I'm your host Alex, but you can call me Senpai, and tonight I am joined by our emotionally drained one, Chinoda. Hello. Which you will find out why you can in hear just a that second. In his voice, bro. You can just can, hear I, it. I can hear. I can hear how emotionally like depleted he is. We also have our czar of source material, John. Can I interest you guys in some candy? Oh, God, no. Oh, God, no. <laughs> That's really bad. <laughs> That's... Listen, Actually, yes, because those are delicious. <laughs> I... I was go... I went to the store, or I had my wife go to the store, and look for the ones in the tin. They don't make them in the tin anymore, but I was going to bring up the tin with the candy and shake them, just mm. to fuck with you guys, but... Man... God. Anyway, thank you for that, John. <laughs> now throw one across the country to me, please. I'll catch it. I promise. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, it's going to be a little bit more of a, um, a more serious movie review than we, we normally do because we're talking about a, a genuinely serious and somber movie. We are going to be doing a movie review of Grave of the Fireflies. A um, couple of things before we get started. Uh, number one is, first of all, if you like what you see here, please consider liking this video. Uh, subscribe if you're not already subscribed to get more movie reviews, spoiler casts, and things like that that we do here on Anime Club After Dark. Uh, but also, um, by the time you're watching this, this film uh, is going to be available on Netflix. Um, I think worldwide. Uh, well, worldwide except for Japan, ironically. Um <laughs> I know I don't I don't get it either, but whatever. Um, so I highly re recommend that if you haven't seen this before, watching this, uh, definitely go watch it on Netflix. Um, it is it is worth your time, uh, and it will make you cry. I promise. <laughs> I promise. Um, but yeah, let's 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 get into it. So um, this movie came out in uh, 1988. Was directed by uh, Isao Takahata. Uh, who also directed uh, Only Yesterday, Pompoko, My Neighbors, The Yamadas, and The Tale of the Princess Kaguya for Studio Ghibli. Um, while this wasn't his directorial debut, um, this was his directorial debut for Studio Ghibli. Um, it's also written by uh, Takahata himself. Um, it was based on the 1967 semi-autobiographical short story by Japanese author uh, Akiyuki Nosaka. Now, I won't really get into it here. Um, I did a little research on Nosaka. Uh, fascinating individual. I highly recommend reading up on him in your own time. Um, rather controversial uh, for the time <laughs> he lived in, to say the least. Uh, but that's, that's, that's all I'll say. Um, this was produced, as I mentioned, by Studio Ghibli and released in Japan on April 16th, 1988, uh, something I found out in my research for this, which was wild to consider. Uh, this was originally released as a Japanese theatrical double feature with My Neighbor Totoro. What a wildly conflicting tone in both of those movies. I wouldn't say it's wildly conflicting. Uh, there's plenty of theories about like My Neighbor Totoro being, being about like death and the afterlife. So, Yeah, but one is a lot more... Well, happy looking <laughs> well my neighbor totoro has you know the ghibli magic right the the fantastical stuff of ghibli and yeah, then there's this doesn't grave of the fireflies where it's like oh this is not fantastical at all this is just depression this, yeah this is just bottled up depression just throwing at my face like please stop please stop um this movie was made on a budget of around three and a three point seven million u.s dollars roughly um i don't was that as I think you looked this up. Was that adjusted for inflation or no? It was not, no. Okay. Um, and this is also wild to me. Uh, Japanese box office, 1.7 billion yen. That's around 12 million U.S. dollars. Yeah, I um, made a bunch of money in Japan. 
And I also now, was able to. I wonder. Follow, I was, oh, go ahead. I wonder if it made that much because it was doubled with my neighbor Totoro. <laughs> Maybe I, I wonder that too. Um, I mean, a Ghibli double feature. Who doesn't want to go see that on a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon? Right. <laughs> with your kids and traumatize no. them with Grave of the Fireflies. <laughs> um, um, back in 2018, there was also a U.S. theatrical release that garnered around half a million dollars as well in a, a only three-day run. Of, so that's actually pretty good. Um, and the film is only 89 minutes long, and boy, does it feel like it goes on for a lot longer. I don't mean that in a bad way, though. It feels like a longer movie than it is. I I think it feels like a longer movie because of how heavy the subject matter is. Yeah. Um, if people don't know, Grave of the Fireflies takes place towards the end of World War II. Um, yeah, in the last where... few months of the war. So that's – and we're watching from the perspective of a, a kid, two kids really. Or I, I guess one kid because there's the main character kid and then his younger sister. Uh, we're watching from their perspective of – basically being orphaned <laughs> yeah um yep. and trying to survive you know wartime japan while being orphaned and it's just yeah. mega depressing bro like the we literally start off watching the main character die um because uh, guess what people die during war but yeah he's like dying but where he dies is at a train station where there's other people who are dead at the train station because they literally were like malnourished or just so messed up from damage from like the war after the war is already over mind you after the war is already over yes because the they were you have like bus station attendants just cleaning up the bodies trying to prepare for the americans arriving because the americans are kind of show up they're like oh we can't show them that our country was so defeated and weak and it's like Mm. dude that is one of the most messed up things about uh, the war in Japan is that the people in the country were suffering so heavily, but the government acted like, oh, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's we're, we're fine. It under the it's, rug. Yeah, they, they pretended to Very not see. So. Yeah. It is so messed up. But I, I, I mean, guess it's not – that's not exclusive to Japan. That's kind of how all governments operate, right? They want to present to be like they're fine. They're, everything's fine. But – in reality, it's like, no, it's not. Their people are suffering, majorly suffering. But they can't yeah. show weakness as a powerful nation. I mean, but, you see that in the movie, too. Like, the people realize that it's going bad, but they're not giving up. They still think that they're going to win. Well, that they was They still the think mindset. if they just serve, yeah. them, serve the country, they're going to win. Yeah, that's the, the mindset of a lot of uh, Japanese military at the time during World War II was like that, where it's like... We have to just believe in the country. You, you, you're you not allowed to believe in anything else but the country. It was the yeah. effect of hyper-nationalism. Yeah. 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 Well, before we get too deep into, like, the story and stuff, should we talk about, like, art and animation a little bit? Because I Shinoda brought up something before we, we talked about the or we started this, and I wanted to talk about it. This – the animation – and art style does feel a little more dated as compared to what it was released with as a double feature, Totoro. Yeah, My Neighbor Totoro looks stunning compared to Grave of the Fireflies. Like, the, the effects, the visuals, they don't really look that great. Um, it's I, obvious it's because that's where all the budget, uh, animation budget went, which is, you know, fair. We understand the reasoning for it, but unfortunately, Grave of the Fireflies did suffer because of this. Yeah, I I mean, I still maintain that The Grave of the Fireflies is more about the story that's being tell, told and like yeah. the oh, perspectives absolutely. of the characters. More so, and that that's really conveyed by the actors. Like, I, so, this is my second time watching it. I Mine first well. my When I first watched it, it was in English. I actually rewatched it in Japanese, because I was like, I wonder what the Japanese dub is like. Because that first original English dub is like it's okay, <laughs> it's not it's not the greatest. Um, I believe they they re-released it with a second set of dubs when Sentai took over. Yes, um, yeah. it does have it does have two different dubs. One that was done in 1998, and the other one was done in 2012. Yeah, so I I've only heard the 98 one. I've never heard the 2012. So maybe the 2012 one. <laughs> maybe I'll watch it again right after this <laughs> to watch the 2012 uh, dubbing of it, but. Uh, I, I watched it in Japanese, and uh, I 
the voice actors did a phenomenal job, in my opinion, uh, conveying like yeah. what emotions they could convey. Because you know, the thing is, this is a very difficult movie to make because it's no secret that I hate children actors. I just absolutely <laughs> do not like them. Uh, All you have just... to do is watch our review of Godzilla minus one, and John will go <laughs> off on the child actor in that. Because, you know, this is a very complicated movie because these kids are experiencing very complicated emotions, but they can't emote that because they're kids. When you were an angsty teen, did, were you able to communicate properly? I I bet you you weren't. So I was able how, to scream really good, though. So how do you, like, convey that type of angst where you're feeling a complex emotion, but you don't know how to deal with it, but you don't know how to emote it either, but you're still frustrated and you still need to give it an outlet? I'm like, yeah, that's very – the nuance in it is very um, hard to copy with children actors especially. Yeah. So I think it did – it was great to go animated – for just being able to use um, voice actors, like professional adult voice actors who could yeah. convey these type of emotions. Because that's the one thing that I found really amazing about this film is how they set up so many, um, so much perspective of like how and framing for like how you're supposed to experience feeling this scene through Seta's eyes, the main character's eyes, and also, the, but then taking a step back and understanding the situation as a whole. Because when I watched it as a kid, I was just like, you know, Sato was right. You know, his his aunt was a bitch. She's a terrible person. But now that I watch it as a 31-year-old um, adult male, I understand, like, oh, this was during wartime Japan. Like, his aunt, his aunt was mean, sure. But at the same time, she's suffering. Her family's suffering just as much as anyone else. Like, we, we can see, like, with the rationing and stuff of food, we can see the... Um, when the things that his aunt's doing, like eating the burnt rice at the very bottom of the rice cooker because there's no fucking food. And, oh, God, how it was framed, though, was just, like, it seemed like she was being mean and evil because it's like she's eating something secretly by herself. And then Seta comes in. And he's like, that looks so good. And it's just like, oh, she's like, is she starving them? And it's like, no, dude, she's not starving them. She's shared Everyone's plenty. Everyone's starving. Everyone's starving. It's like, oh, my God. And that's what's so great about this movie, you know, when they they layer it like that throughout the entire film, which is fucking yeah. fantastic. That's something I, I definitely – as Go ahead. This is the personal thing with me. When I – this is when, when she, like, gets the gristle up with the burnt rice and eats mm-hmm. it, I'm like, God, that looks so good. I've oh, yeah. That. I think roasted I've rice tastes it. amazing. I think yeah. – listen, when you – the gristle on the bottom of the pan when you, like – pan fries and stuff oh shit that's good now i will say on top of that um the visuals that they use as well as the lighting they use to convey effects and emotions in this movie were utterly fantastic especially with the budget that they had to work with they damn near worked a miracle with that honestly in my opinion one thing I, I did like about the background art in particular about this is I think it does do a really good job of, like, showing, especially when they're showing, like, the destroyed cities and stuff, mm-hmm. just how hopeless the situation is for everybody. Right. Not just for the main characters, just for everybody. Yeah. You s- yeah, truly they, saw how everyone was suffering. They definitely spent the budget on, like, animating the very important things to animate, like, um... When, you know, in the very beginning after the air raid and he goes and sees his mom, she's all bandaged up and, like, looks, you know, she's messed up. And then when they come back to her. That fucked me up as a kid, by the way. Oh, God. When they cut back to her and there's all those maggots and stuff crawling on her skin. It's like, oh, oh my. Oh, oh, that was so. It's it's, it's great, but it's also like, oh, God, I can't. Oh, yeah. It's it's very it's very emotionally evocative. But it's also as a kid, you look at that and you're like, oh, my God. It, it haunts you. Um, but yeah, I stuff like that, I, I really... I, I hate saying that I enjoyed it, but it conveys the emotions that it's definitely trying to convey very, very well um, yeah. through what it does with its art. Um, and I, I appreciate that way more now as an adult watching that than I ever did as a kid. Because I think I was only... 10 or 11 years old when i watched this and i like i got through watching this i'm like that wasn't a fun ghibli movie at all <laughs> right I, I feel like a lot of people's experience with grave of the fireflies is oh ghibli film i'm used to watching princess mononoke spirited away how's moving castle then you watch grave of the fireflies and you're like oh that wasn't happy or fantastical at all that was just oh i feel like dying oh <laughs> 
Yeah. Watching it as a like, – I think I was 14 or 15 when I first watched it. Uh, as an angsty teenager, uh, <laughs> I definitely felt like uh, it was I, – I thought it was like an anti-war sentiment. Like I thought this was a movie about the horrors of war, which it kind of is. But It is. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't say that's the main focus of it now that I've rewatched it. I, I don't think that's the main focus of it at all. No. They've actually the... come out and said several times that, no, that that is, in fact, not the main focus of it. It is an aspect of it, but it's not what it's about at all. Right, because it, it's, yeah. it's a very it's a very surface-level understanding of this film, uh, just thinking that it's about anti-war. It's like, not necessarily, because there is a lot more present themes in it, which is about the, the main character, Seita, the youth, and him experiencing the world and withdrawing from society because he doesn't know how to express himself. And it's like, that makes yeah. a lot more sense, actually. Yeah. Um, something I also wanted to talk about is the music for this movie. is It's composed by Michio Mamiya, um, who is a Japanese composer who hasn't done a great deal of, like, composing work for anime. I think he's only done, like, two other anime scores in the past and is... Not, not not notable scores, like not for notable anime. Um, this is by far his most popular movie he's ever scored. Um, and he's more known as like a classical or Baroque composer of like Japanese classical music. Mm -hmm. um, was an interesting choice for this movie. There's not a whole lot of music in the movie. Um, the, the soundtrack is mostly, besides the dialogue, is a lot of silence and uh, like background noise. I will say the main theme song, uh, Home Sweet Home. Yes. Fantastic. Utterly fantastic when you heard it. Yeah, at the very end. Yeah, I I would say it's no Joe Hisaishi, but mm. no, <laughs> it's uh, definitely, I wouldn't say it was terrible. There are certain uh, moments where they're like, hey, play the heartstrings, play play the violin heartstrings to tug really at the scene. Yeah. Where I'm like, you bastard. You got to kick me while I'm down. <laughs> why, why, why you got to do that, man? I was already sad at the scene. Now you got to play the yeah. sad music too. Like, come on. I would argue, though, like the, the scenes that where there's just no music and there's just like sad shit happening, are, it's almost more evocative because there's no music playing. So you're like, you're fully invested in what's going on on screen. Well, yeah, because a lot of the... I would the... say you're not just fully invested, you're fully immersed as well. Yeah. Well, because well, there's supposed to be the, um, you know, we have the, the happy siblings who are trying to make the best of their situation in a very, very desperate and terrible situation, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so it's like the, that juxtaposition really shows the disparity between the two, and it's freaking amazing. And they do that with the sound design, as with the animation and the sound design. They use it very effectively. Yeah. Especially the scenes with the American bombers. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. and That would terrify people, the fuck out of me, too. <laughs> if people didn't know, um, the firebombings that the Americans did over Japan killed more Japanese citizens and leveled more cities than both of the nukes. Yep. Um, yeah. I believe it was like over 2.2 million firebombs. Um, and for the case of the Something nuke, like that. they went ahead and like put in they, they dropped a bunch of flyers saying hey we're dropping a big bomb it's gonna kill everything in within this like get out with the yeah. fire bombs they didn't they just bombed places and they would bomb places like hospitals they would bomb places um that were ammo depots so that way the fire would spread more it was really jacked up i was in ap government and i i had to debate whether the nukes were worse or the fire bombs were worse and i i, I was on the fire bomb side I had you know, to tell people. I had to do a lot of research about this in, in uh, high school, and I was like, "Oh God, I, yeah. <laughs> the atrocities of war! Like it's it is messed up." Oh my God! I mean, the the Incredible. the atomic bombings get like all of the the publicity and stuff when people talk about World War II in the Pacific, um, and they were quite horrific for what they were. But yeah, the fire bombings of like Tokyo and Osaka, the, those were horrific as well and i would say we literally in, in in a recent anime in uh slime tensei they talk about the fire bombings in tokyo uh shizuru she she dies from the fire bombings yeah yep. um it's left good. a cultural impact and yeah. such a massive history yeah um i will say i think it would have been really easy to just go with like the nuke being the inciting incident like maybe like a Hiroshima or Nagasaki, whichever one. 
I'm glad they didn't because I feel like it wouldn't be anywhere near as effective of showing like the absolute devastation that the fire bombings caused. And I was the fire bombings displaced way more people than the atomic bombings did. Yeah, like we see the atomic bomb, we're like, because it's this big, great, scary thing. But like I said, the, look at the kill count, man. The the fire bombings, yeah. the strategic planning of how they used fire bombings versus like the two places that they bombed with uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's like it's yeah. completely different scale. Like we think the nukes were the worst part. It's like it's not really the worst part. Like you've yeah. got a country in poverty, impoverished, starving, and now you have Americans just bombing all of their fucking their storehouses, their fucking food rations, and they don't even Farms. have food. Yeah, it's fucked up, bro. War is fucked up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know really how to move on from that. Um, Time to I guess, talk about the music. I, I mean, we're, that's what we were talking about. We were talking about, about the um, music. I, no, it's time to talk uh, about the, the narrative, the good part. <laughs> the yeah, the well, most amazing the, thing about this film. The, the good part in quotation marks like it's good because it's done well it's not good because we like what happened yeah so um the story reflects upon uh the main character seta's life as he's dying uh and we see flashbacks of his life like before he dies so a couple months beforehand uh we're in end at end of the months of the pacific war or the pacific yeah. what whatever the Pacific Theater. The, the, Pacific. the last few months of World War Two. Last few months of World War Two in the Pacific Theater, and it's like it's sad and depressing. I don't know how to say this. Uh, narratively, like I said, when I first watched it, I I hated the uh, adults in it. I hated the people who didn't help out the kids because it's like in my mind as a kid, it's like adults are supposed to help kids, but. Yeah problem is i didn't have for the whole the big picture the perspective the whole perspective of adults should help kids you're right but this is during wartime where everyone is suffering not everyone yeah. is starving and it shows like the uh, naivete of like the main character seta where it's like he thinks oh as long as we have money or as long as we have stuff to trade we can get more food we can get medicine and it's like that's not how it works buddy like no. they're are people it's how who it don't beforehand and that's all he's ever known yeah and it, it, it's like the movie does an amazing job positioning that like where we see uh in one scene Santa goes to the beach and he has a flashback um where it shows like his family is at the beach his mom is still alive and it's like how extravagant that is and it's like his family has yeah. always been well off like in the beginning it, they're getting it, like a professional portrait made of the family too yep. yeah and it's like the luxury that this guy lived in was completely amazing compared to everyone else around here. And we can see that because even though we're at the end of the uh, last months of World War II, uh, Seta's family still has sugar. His family still has pickled plums. They have re le very luxurious resources. Butter. Where he has butter. Everyone else literally has just rice. Rice and maybe potatoes and sugar cane. Maybe. Everyone else is yeah. suffering, but his family is well off, and it's because his dad is a it's like an admiral or captain. He's he's a high ranking official of the U, uh, I was about to say U.S. Navy, uh, Japanese Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong side. So, all he knows is that as long as we have money, we can get taken care of, and that's just like it, it's so sad because it's like yeah, he's a kid. Why would he know any better? He doesn't. Yeah, but. When he has to go live with his aunt because, you know, his mom gets killed in the first firebombing that happens in the first, like, five minutes of the film, he he doesn't know what to do. And, like, he feels like he's out of place there because his aunt is kind of mean to them. And they frame that so well, dude. How they framed the aunt at the very beginning or throughout the film made me think that she was a huge bitch. I was like, as a kid, I was like, man, she's a fucking terrible person. I hate that aunt. But as an adult, it's like, I, I can't hate her. It's like, yeah, I think you should try to be an, an upstanding person at all times, like help kids especially. But I, I can't say what would happen if I was put in, this, in the same position where my, me and my family are starving. We are being, we've been rationed for the last couple months and your family just came in and you guys haven't had to ration and you're not sharing any of your stuff with us and I have to take care of you and I get nothing from it. Dude, that's... That would turn anyone into a fucking monster in anyone's eyes. But how they frame it to make it seem like Seta is like, it, when we frame it through Seta's eyes, it's like, oh, she's she's a monster. 
But then when you think about it from her perspective, it's like, no, she's just suffering like everyone else. Yeah, just like, trying to get by. Yeah, and it's like another example is like <laughs> when she's like, if you want to complain about me not giving you enough food, like you guys can go cook your own food. And Santa is like, all right, fucking bet. I'll go do it myself. And then he goes and he spends the money to go buy a fucking charcoal grill so he can go make their own food and he doesn't have to share their food that they have with his aunt's family. And it's like, you know, I was a kid once and I was like, when I was a kid thinking of watching this, I was like, yeah, fuck her. You you show her, Santa, you know, like fucking bet. The catharsis. Yeah, but now as an adult, I'm just like, you know, the aunt may have said that, but again, she's starving. She's hungry. Uh, and she's she didn't really mean it in the sense like I want you to go cook your own food, but it's like Seta is not really thinking about his position in this family that his fam like he has to do something for them because they are all supposed to work together to keep going, but he all he does is sit at home all day, in which you can argue like okay, well he's supposed to be you know he's a kid first and foremost he just lost his mom and he has no idea where his dad is he has no other relatives other than his aunt. And he just doesn't know how to process any of this. And it's like, that's true. And he doesn't have anyone there to help guide him or process, help him process all of his emotions right now. And it's just like, it's so shitty. Because it's like, if this was... I would say the ant's a bad person if this was in, like, a, not a wartime, not a, in a very um, fucked up position where everyone's starving and they can't If it afford... was like today. Yeah, like, there is a reason she's being mean. There is a reason she's... She, I wouldn't even say she was that mean either. She's like, she's being harsh with her words, but she's still feeding you. She's she being pragmatic. Yeah, she's not beating you or anything like that. And it's... She's not asking for payments because, you know, you're kids. But she's like, Seita, you you know, you're old enough. You can join the fire brigade. You can help out. You can do other things. Like, you're not going to school. So, and it's just like... It hurts, dude. It, it fucking hurts. Like how they frame it to make her seem so evil like a, like an evil stepmom but she's not that evil like it counts on the we were having a adult perspective uh to appreciate her sentiment because when you're much younger yeah she comes off as a complete bitch yeah but when you when you're looking at it from the big picture you understand exactly what she's going through. She's suffering, her family's suffering, everyone is just trying to survive. She just got dumped uh, with her sister's kids. She got told her sister's dead, and, like, she's just trying to be pragmatic and trying to survive, and both of them are just staying at home. One of them is a little kid, so no choice but to take care of her. The other one can maybe do some work, but he's but not. he doesn't. And... Yeah, he's, like, just freaking staying at home and it's like you don't have time to teach him why you should and shouldn't because you're trying to contribute to the war effort as well as on, on yeah. top of trying to survive and it, it's just an extremely shitty picture and you have to look at it from the big picture and it sucks because you understand no one's a bad guy everyone's suffering wow this sucks yeah, yeah war sucks. well it, it's it, yeah um and, like, all the adults that they meet throughout the course of this movie, up until the point where the movie is ending and the war is over, they all buy into that fantasy of we're going to win because we're giving ourselves to the, our, the service Yeah, we're doing our Japan. part by They by all buy into that fantasy. And yeah, Every yeah. single one of them buy fully hook, line, and sinker into that fantasy. If they just work harder, we're going to win the war. And, again, this was... A huge part of what made Japan last so long, the hyper-nationalism that was stoked by the <clears throat> Japanese government of its citizenry, suffer now so that the great Japanese empire may win. And yeah. we, we saw clearly what happened. They awakened the, the dragon that could not be beaten, but they didn't know that. They were like, we're Japan, we can do anything. And it's interesting watching throughout the movie the less people are willing to do for others, especially as the war draws closer and closer to close. Like you see that they're not willing to take money for stuff and they just, cause they don't have anything to give or they're not willing to trade what they were trading yesterday for what they're willing to trade for today. Um, and that's Up like the reality of the situation. People are losing more and more of their stuff. They're losing their creature comforts because all their um, their houses, their their cities are being bombed to submission. They're constantly having to move around. People are tired and they're like at their 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 limit. Yeah. 
And and the film does a good job portraying that. No, and it's uh, very true. Like, up until a certain mo- point, money does equal resources. Until it's resources that equal resources. Then Yeah, because money doesn't mean anything if I don't have enough to feed myself and my family. I don't give a well, fuck. Money also doesn't mean anything if the person you're trying to trade with doesn't think it's worth anything. Yeah, because yeah. what's the point of having all that money if you don't have food? Like, you're going to starve to death before you can even spend the money. I mean, you even see that in the, the toward the like the two thirds mark of the movie where the farmer beats him because he cut, catches him stealing the sugar cane. Yeah, it's like this far. That's all the farmer has left, and you're stealing all that he has left. Yeah, and it's like, do you understand like how bad of a crime it is to be stealing during wartime when we're rationing? Yeah, like you're... people straight up were executed for that. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. Like. Oh my! It's for my baby sister. She's dying. She needs the medicine. She needs the sugar to help calm her diarrhea. And it's like he doesn't give a shit about that. He's got a daughter. He needs to take care of. Yeah, he's got that's a just the, he's that's, got himself. Yeah, it, it's like it's not like people were not helping the kids and stuff uh, because they were mean or they just like oh it's not our problem. Uh, I they mean, had it, their own families to take. Yeah, care it's of. like they they just didn't have the capacity to do that. And again, as a kid, I. It just looks like all the adults are super shitty, uh, except the police officer. He's like the only one who's like cut the kid a break, feel bad for him. Yeah. But no, it's everyone else suffering, and they they just do not have the ability or the capacity to care about everyone anyone else other than their own people right now. And I like just, how that's I like reality. that scene though. I love that scene though with the police officer after he gets beaten by the farmer when the police officer like talks down the farmer because the pl- the farmer wants him to be like arrested and charged and you know even more worse stuff done to him and the, the police officer's like I think you've beaten him enough so much so that I could charge you with assault. <laughs> yeah, it's like and then you he's know like, it's illegal oh, wait, to wait, wait, beat wait, wait. minors, right? <laughs> I like I like that scene because it shows that like not only does he recognize that yeah the kid needed to be punished, but the farmer went a little too far. Yeah, I mean, again, I I think the farmer is justified because stealing crops, especially when my family is starving and stuff, and you contributed yeah. literally nothing to grow this stuff, and now you're stealing it from me and my family. I'm like no, but yeah, this film it does a great job at showing you the perspective of Seta and then like the perspective of the adults and then juxtaposing different uh, purviews because when we get to the end like when the war is finally over and like oh god it's so sad when the war is finally over and uh, Seta's younger sister Setsuko dies from malnutrition and it's like the it seems like the adults don't care right he goes to the clinic and he's like please save my baby sister and she's like well she's suffering from malnutrition next and there's, just like, there's give, no medicine for that. The medicine is eat food. Yeah, and it's like, how do you get her to eat food when there is no food to eat? <laughs> yeah, and he even asks, what food? Where's the food? And the the doctor never answers because he can't. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, dude. There is no Hell, food. Right before that, you have the scene where they're making like the fake rice balls out of mud. Yeah. And just looking at him like, I wish we had some. God, heartbreaking heartbreaking and um so then she setsuko dies and he's like he learns that the war is over and he's like all fucked up he's like what we lost the war how could the great japan lose the war and you have all these people going to the bank and they're all happy because the war is finally over and it's like that that means good things because if the war is finally over we don't have to ration anymore we can go back to rebuilding society and feeding ourselves and doing things for ourselves instead of contributing to the war effort and Things go back to normal. Yeah. The uh, the difference in perspective and the like, the dichotomy, right, the, or the contrast between like when he goes to the uh, person to get charcoal to burn his sister because you know he has to cremate his sister because she's dead now. He's all fucking happy and stuff, and you're just like, what the fuck? Why is he so happy? It's like, oh, your sister died. Well, I've got a special delivery of charcoal. You can use this. You know, there's a temple over there. And it's like, you can, you can use such a nice and hot grounds. day. Yeah, but it's like, why is he so fucking happy? And it's like, Seta is experiencing the worst time of his fucking life because now his baby sister is dead, and he has nothing left, and he's fucking starving. And here's this dude who's just like all sunshine and happy rainbow. And it's like, what the fuck? And it's like because, again. From his perspective, it's like this person's being an asshole, but it's like, no, 
this adult is glad that the war is over. The fact that he doesn't have to ration shit anymore. That's why it's like, oh, we have extra um, charcoal so you can take your sister and burn her. He's just happy yeah. that the war is over. He's happy that they don't have he's, to do this he shit talks, anymore. He talks so casually about death, too, almost like he's gotten so used to seeing death. Yeah, because it's like like we saw at the very end. You're not a special case, bro. Like, as much as it sucks, as much as we are supposed to, like, watch this through Seita's eyes and he's supposed to be the main character, he's not unique in this situation. There are plenty of people who were orphaned during the war and who starved on the streets, who had nothing. And he, the film does make an effort to point that out as well, is the thing. Yeah. You see it in the very beginning. Look at all the, the people that are hunched over dead in the bus station. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the the ending of this is so cruel. <laughs> it is, it's, because at oh. the very end, we have, like, people returning you to think the, the country. War's, the war's over, so they're going to, like, be saved, and it's like, no... No, the people who the, couldn't be saved were not going to be saved. Um, and we can see, like, so we start off with Seta and his family being, like, up here, upper echelon, you know, rich and stuff like that. And then we end with Seta being just broke, poor, and diseased and going to die. On the streets, basically. On the street versus, like, there's the people who, who survived the war. And they're, like, back in the countryside. They're like, oh, my gosh, our house is still here. And they live in a I fucking... I miss this view. Yeah, and it's like they, they have nice clothes. They can finally listen to the gramophone. And it's like, we can't believe the war is over. And it's like, Seta used to be up here, and now he's down here. And I was like, dude, the, sw- the, the, the swap between him being... The dichotomy. Yeah, yeah. It's, ah, it's so good. There's so much... Yeah so much uh framing that they do in this film that is so effective it's so good ah. yeah um it doesn't really pull many punches when it shows just how brutal the war was in japan for japanese people both the upper echelons of society and the people who were either in the middle or near the bottom like it's it was rough yeah um and any other film i think any other story would have the war be over and everyone have their happy ending, but this one doesn't. And as sad as that is, as gut wrenching and as like just oh, just like stabbing through the heart that as that is, I appreciate it for that because it's very real. It's what yeah. a lot of people experienced. Uh, it's not happy. It's not. It's not uh, not what you might expect, but it is very real. It's yeah, extremely it, poignant. It makes this hard. It makes this very hard to recommend. Yeah, because one, it's a very sad movie. Two, it's kind of old, so it's a little, little bit dated and janky animation. But it's a good overall story. But it's very hard to recommend because it's like, you know, I don't think people need to be able to have the perspective to enjoy the film. But unfortunately, I feel like to in, to fully understand this film, you need that type of perspective to understand like the atrocities of war but also to understand you know being a kid growing up and not understanding things around you because in all honesty if Seta just fucking bit his tongue and lived with his aunt and just listened to her like join the fire brigade and split whatever they had and tried to help out with that new family that he was in yeah. or just um, worked around the house or just worked around the house like doing something for his aunt I'm fairly certain that him and Setsuko would have lived. Yeah. They might have survived, is the thing. And that's one of the things I hate about him the most because he just had to bite his pride and just yeah, take a little bit of it. But he didn't. And yeah. it's his own fault that his sister died. Yeah, like when he was trading with the farmer uh, for the first time and it's like the farmer would take money, but then when he goes back the second time, it's like... We, I'm not taking kimonos and money. Like, I don't have enough for my own family. And, you know, Seita's, like, pissed off. He's like, I can't believe that. Like, we'll just go to a different place. But the farmer's like, maybe, kid, you should just swallow your pride and go back to your aunt and apologize. And he's just like, no, fuck that. And again, rebellious teen me was like, yeah, no, fuck that farmer. Fuck that aunt. As an adult, I'm like, bro, that's the, that's the best decision you could make right now, Seita. Your sets go would be alive. You would be alive right now if you did this. Yeah, and even if even if Setsuko wouldn't have made it through, still there's a good chance that he would have made it through at the very least, and survived. I feel like Setsuko may have survived. Like if because of how you get treated for contributing to the war effort, if Seta, who is now a 
at, he's a teenager. He's like 13 or 14 or whatever. Uh, yeah. He would have been able to do a lot of jo- odd jobs to help around for the yeah. war effort, and he could have got more food. There were things he could have done, but he chose not and to. And even after because, the war, he could have helped with recovery and probably gotten fed. Yeah, but he chose not to because, you know, kid, <laughs> naivete. Yeah. And he, do you think he directly also... caused his sister to die because of that, which is so yeah. sad. So do you think there's also a like part of the reason that he just kind of withers away and dies is because he's racked with like survivor's guilt after the fact? I fully believe that Sada's death was a form of suicide. I think he I mean, he doesn't have up. to like yeah, he gave up because as we saw towards the end, he started um because he still he had some money. He steals like during he learned Seta learned that because adults can't help us right now, because you know he he's a freaking I wouldn't say spoiled, but he doesn't understand that the adults aren't helping him because they don't have that much. He doesn't have themselves. perspective. Yeah, he doesn't have that type of perspective. But he learns that well, if the adults aren't going to help me, then I'll help myself. So he starts stealing. Like he starts stealing crops. He starts stealing during the air raids. Like when uh everyone's running to the shelters he runs into the town that's getting fire stealing clothes he and steals food things and... that he steals like he eats their food he'll steal their clothes he'll steal stuff that he can try to sell for money but then as it turns out like towards the end uh after he steals he tries to go and sell all these things to these people and it's like they don't even want it because they're like this is fucking trash i don't need this right now like what the fuck's wrong with you kid get the fuck out of here yeah um, so the reason I asked that about the whole survivor's guilt thing is because when I was doing research for this, um, Nosaka, who wrote the original uh, short story that this is based off of, and it's it's a semi semi autobiographical story about his life and surviving the fire bombings of the city of Kobe. Um, his sister did die um, due to starvation and malnutrition, um, and he has said in interviews afterwards that since he survived he had survivor's guilt all of his life after that because he was constantly feeding himself first before he fed his sister which is a natural like human response to care take care of yourself before you take care of someone else like it's kind of just human nature and i can see how that would mess with you psychologically down the road because that's what Satan does (coughs) like when he steals food he knows he can't transport it so he eats it right away and just it's hit. Oh God, freaking Sata, man! It's your fault. Your sister died. Like, come on. Yeah. And I then the author of the original short story blames himself for killing his sister because he would constantly feed himself first before he fed his sister when they found food. Yeah, and it's just it's sad uh, because towards the end, like when Sata like just essentially starves himself to death, he loses the will to live, the will to fight because like we saw he picked up all these skills because he was like i'm gonna be i'm gonna live i'm gonna scrap and survive i'm gonna but i'm gonna be a a big brother to my sister well the problem is that he again in his naivete was focused on the wrong thing he figured if i was able to eat i can eat now and have some food or whatever so i'm not starving but i can steal their clothes and stuff and sell stuff uh their pots and stuff and i can use that money to help my sister but he still doesn't understand that no one wants that stuff right now, man. People want food. They don't want your fucking kimonos and fucking clay pots. No one gives a shit about that right now. And it's just like, ah, oh, yeah. it's so sad. Yeah. Got it. Like, it's so hard to talk about this movie without getting a little emotional, isn't it? I would say so, yeah. I've teared yeah. up a couple of times during this recording. Just thinking about, <laughs> like, oh, God, the stuff that, that happened. Ugh. Um. Yeah, it's not. It's not a happy story. It doesn't have a happy ending. But I think that's for the best. Like it's, I think it's one of the better war movies ever made. Certainly one of the best. I think you've talked about it being like your in your top fifty movies of all time. Yeah, like I, I think that Grave of the Fireflies is not just a great anime movie, but just a great movie in general, and. Yeah it is in my top 50 movies of all time because of that it's such a strong film yeah i think like i think a lot of that strength comes from the fact that it is based on an actual true story of someone's life going through the war well i I just think about like how they frame certain things how they do the perspectives how they show the dichotomy and stuff like that it's for sure it's done so well in this film 
that that's why like the narrative quality of it is so strong and that's why i can forgive it for not looking great or not uh having great uh effects and amazing soundtrack and all this stuff like it i that's all secondary because to me the main point of this film was the story that we have to see from through Seta's eyes yeah and i do find it interesting how every time this film was shown uh at any theaters any screenings any uh theatrical uh experiences festivals it got spread even more because um uh, the critics and people who could spread the movie were like oh my god i have to show this to everyone because that's how strong the uh story of it was yeah it's like it's not just a anime movie it's not just a ghibli film it is a film of all time yeah. because of the story that it can it has crafted and it's i don't know if it's because it's rooted in reality it's based on a someone's life that it's, it's more impactful it might just be but there, there's just so much going on in the film that it's just like again you don't think grave of the fireflies when you when i think of ghibli films i never think of grave of the fireflies ever like that's not part no. of ghibli's uh repertoire but I know that Ghibli did this, but but in my mind, Grave of the Fireflies stands above Ghibli. It's not a Ghibli film. Ghibli helped produce it, sure, they animated it and stuff, but this is its own film, you know, like yeah. one of the greats, you know? <laughs> it stands um, above, yeah. You know, Shinoda, you mentioned uh, critics. I want to I wanna quote one critic in particular that I found um, who a lot of people probably have heard of, the great Roger Ebert. Uh, mm -hmm. reviewed this movie back in March of 2000. And the last paragraph of his review kind of sums up how I feel about this movie. Uh, and it's, he says, quote, because this is an animated film from Japan, Grave of the Fireflies has been little seen. When anime fans tell you how good this film is, no one will take you take them seriously. Now that it's available on DVD with a choice of subtitles or English dubbing, maybe it will finally find the attention it so rightly deserves. Yes, this is a yes. You may say this is a cartoon, and yes, the kids have eyes like saucers. But in my estimation, it belongs on the list of the greatest war films ever made. See? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think I could have said it any better. Um, I think that it's great that this movie will finally be available on streaming somewhere for people to watch. Um, because right as of the time of recording this, not the time it comes out, the only way you could really watch it is if you had a, a physical copy. Because um, I don't think this is streaming on Disney+. Plus. I could be wrong about that. Um I don't think it I, is. I don't think so. I no. know they have. I think they have almost every other Ghibli movie, but not this one. Um. Yeah, that's unless you guys have anything else to say about it. It's Grave of the Fireflies. No, I mean, <laughs> there's not too much to I, talk about. It's a great film. Go watch it. It's sad. Be be prepared to cry. Um, it's something. It's something that if you have watched it in the past, especially if you were young like myself and John, give it another shot as an adult. Yeah, you'll understand a lot more about the film watching it. Yeah. The nuance time. is insane, and it's it's funny because both John and I have watched it now twice. Uh, Chinoda just watched it for the very first time, literally like an hour before recording this. I no. Are you okay, even, buddy? I I literally finished it about fifteen minutes before we started recording. Do you need a hug? I am very drained and empty inside. That's exactly how I felt both times I've watched this movie. Yeah. I didn't cry. <laughs> you, John, you rewatched it last night and you said you went to work and didn't give a fuck. I was emotional. I had no capacity to feel any other emotion because I, because the movie made me cry and I like four times throughout it and I was just sad. And then after yeah. all of that, I was like, that was so emotionally draining of a film to watch. So I can't, I have no emotional capacity to love or hate or anything. So everyone just like, leave me alone, please. I don't have the battery for this. I rewatched it last night and like, I sat there after the movie was over for like, it had to be a good 15, 20 minutes just staring straight ahead like, man, I don't even know how I go on from this. 
Yeah. While I was watching it, I had to pause a couple of times, like collect myself because I'm like, oh, I'm getting too too sad at this right now. I need to just calm down, stop, process it, please. Where's my cat? Give me cuddles. <laughs> uh, I have I to guess say to that, ra- oh, that ahead, last uh, little section after she died um, and you saw Setsuka uh, playing and living in the case in the, as, in as the, the ghost memory yeah yeah what a gut punch i mean wow yeah because that throughout hurt. the film we see through uh Seta's eyes but not setsuko's eyes of what she was doing while Seta was out fucking stealing shit and doing up whatever so it's like she was just yeah. kind of just living life in the cave and it's just like oh, that also sense. that last that last little uh bit that last little tiny scene where you see them on the park bench overlooking like modern the city of modern kobe mm-hmm. that's pretty good too yeah to show that like even at at the end through all the suffering they still survived they th- still were able to rebuild and which is a great the nation thing. survived even if they didn't yeah which is like it's uh, it kind of gives you like a happy note at the end, but at the same time, it's like, oh, it's very but... bittersweet, really. It's, yeah, it's a very bittersweet ending. I mean, <laughs> yeah, un- un- unfortunately, um, I I guess to round this out, um, I ten out of ten movie easily for me. Um, like John, this is definitely in my list of some of the best, one of the best movies ever made. Um, I think it's definitely in my top ten. Of best war movies ever made easily um yeah it's it's great um highly recommend it um it's just you probably only want to watch it once especially if you watch it as an adult <laughs> yeah uh I, it feel wrong to not give it a 10 out of 10 if i'm like yeah this is one of the best movies of all time so it's like oh but also it's not a 10 out of 10 film it's like you know eight out of ten and it's like no 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 like um yeah, aside from, like, the, the dated animation and stuff like that, uh, it's still... I care only really about the story. And they used very effectively the art and animation they, they, that it did have. And so, it, the same with the sound effects. So, to me, that's, like, it's passable. It, we can leave that out of me deterring my score. Or the story is good score. enough for you that you can forgive any kind of inconsistencies or datedness with animation and stuff right yeah. um for me i give it a nine out of ten i do think it is absolutely masterful in its plot the only point the single point i knock on it is for the dated animation and that's honestly such a weak thing to knock on but th- that is a critique i have and that is the single only critique i can't say the story is beyond fantastic amazingly written uh amazing portrayals by the actors absolutely fantastic i will never watch this again (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. i definitely didn't want to rewatch it again ever but i i had to for the episode but i'm glad i did I, I'm glad I did too because I have a, a different perspective on it than I did when I watched this when I was like ten or eleven. Um, and you know, what better reason to rewatch it than the fact that it's going to be on a streaming service that a lot of people have access to now? Oh, God, I did for get... a lot of people who are going to watch <laughs> Grave of the Fireflies for the first I, time. I'm so sorry. Cannot, <laughs> I, I I'm so sorry. I also cannot wait. There's going to be at least one horrible Twitter take after a bunch of people watch this movie. I'm sure. Oh, I'm more sure, than one, but that's Twitter. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of people who view it surface level, you know, like, oh, look guys, at this. Guys, the Americans are really the bad guys here. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Especially um, if you're a Japanese citizen. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, um, watching it, I, I got the Blu-ray several years ago from a Sentai booth at one of the cons I went to, and... No, you I've were with putting... me at Otakon. I remember when you bought it. Was it? Was it? Yes, with it you? was at Otakon in 2019. Oh wow. Okay, so yeah, I did get it several years ago, and I've been putting off for uh, apparently years upon years, and this made me for- watch it. And I, I don't regret it, but my God, what a film! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's quite the emotional ride um 
but I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Um, I I know it's very different for us to do such a somber, like serious episode like this, but uh, thank you for everyone for dropping in uh, to watch us talk about Grave of the Fireflies. Um, let us know down below in the comments what you think about this movie. Um, and uh, <laughs> please give us a suggestion for a much happier movie to review, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, also don't forget to like and subscribe uh, if you like what you saw and want to see more you can also check down below uh, to find links to Anime Club After Dark on Twitter TikTok, Discord, all that good stuff as well as a link to our merch store where you can help us out that way if you want with that I have been your host Alex and we will see you next time say goodnight guys Good night. I just want to apologize for how I am right now obviously I just watched it and um very dead inside but also the fact that i'm a big brother and i come from a war-torn country where i've seen a lot of things like this hit me a lot lot more hard than i thought it would so yeah understandable it's very understandable, understandable. i really night, wanted uncle. in on a happy note god damn no. it you know. nope. <laughs> i'm sorry sober it's, now it's, yeah. it's somber it's, it's a somber